Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our second live webinar. I hope everyone can hear me well. Please let us know if you have any technical difficulties or any problem hearing us. So our IT director is here with us so he can sort things out very quickly and help you with any issue that you might have. So we'll just wait for another minute to make sure that everyone had the time to join in. Okay, uh, let's roll. <clears throat> My name is Ben Amesci Amoli. I am the Research Development and Marketing Director at MG Chemicals. I'm delighted to welcome you all to, uh, to our today's webinar. Thanks for taking the time and uh, being with us today. So our first live webinar, which we held about a month ago, was on MG Chemicals EMI RFI solutions. We received a lot of positive feedback about this webinar, which is really great. If you missed it or would like to watch it again or use it for training, etc., it is available on our YouTube channel and also on our website. The link is also in our LinkedIn page as well. So we have a big turnout today too, similar to the previous session, uh, which is very promising. It encourages us to do more of these webinars for our other lines as well. So we will announce the upcoming webinars soon, so please stay tuned for that. For those who were not with us uh, in the previous session, just a little bit of background about our speaker. Michael is strong, our technical support manager, prepares and brings these webinars to you. He has a master's degree in physical chemistry and spectroscopy. He is our lead scientist and in-house expert when it comes to conformal coding. Michael has over 13 years of experience in coding characterization and development. And now, over eight years at MG Chemicals, he helped our company to develop and streamline our very robust and extensive line of conformal codings. What we are hoping you take away uh, from today's webinar is a good understanding about conformal codings, what they are, why people use them, how they protect PCB, what are the different types of conformal coding, and making you familiar with our product offerings and help you to choose the right product for your or your customers and need. Uh, like the first one, uh, at the beginning of today's session, we will have a 30 minute presentation followed by about 20 minutes Q and A. So you can type in your question at any point during the presentation or at the end. So we will do our best to read that and respond to this, to the question the best we can. So same as before, the webinar will be recorded, the whole session will be recorded and made available on our website, YouTube channel. I think we should, you will receive an email uh, after this, pro probably a day after, the, uh, after today, uh, with a link to download the webinar. So uh, let's get right into it. Uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Benham, for that introduction. Welcome to the second installment of the MG Chemicals webinar series. Today's webinar is entitled Electronic Ruggedization Using Conformal Coatings. Here we're going to discuss MG Chemicals conformal coatings portfolio. So with that, let's get started. On the agenda for today, we have five topics to break this down. First, we're going to look at why conformal coating? What is the principal use of conformal coating? Where are they used and what are their limitations? From there, we segue to industry standards. And here we're gonna discuss the different standards available that certify conformal coatings as being fit for use. From there, we dive into MG chemicals. What solutions do we have within our portfolios? And from that, we're gonna look at certain criteria on how to break down choosing the right conformal coating based on requirements. And finally, to cap it off, we're going to look at some application notes and resources. 
All right, so first off, why conformal coding? What purpose do they serve? Printed circuit boards are comprised of many different components, transistors, capacitors, things like these, all with very unique topography. So these conformal coatings, they are flexible top coats that conform to these components, protecting them from everyday contaminants. Things like moisture, for example, and this can be you know, rain, snow, dew, condensation, things like that. Dust, another one, dust is electrically charged, so if it were to land between traces, it could potentially sort out a circuit. There's also the threat long-term, if you're in sort of a moist environment, of fungal growth. And these fungus can actually attack either the shrink wrap on a lot of the components, or they themselves could potentially short out and damage a circuit board. The other one is electrical arcing. And this is because circuit boards nowadays have become so specialized, powerful, miniaturized that these traces are placed so close together. So there's an instance where you could have a lot of current flowing through the circuit and it may have the potential to jump from one trace to the other, shorting out the circuit. And these conformal coatings help protect against that. It's an insulative layer that provides extra electrical insulation to prevent these kinds of shorts from happening. Now it's a clear coat, but what we end up doing, we put a UV tracer in, so when you flash it under black lamp, it fluoresces. So that's a good way to check for coverage of the coating. Now some common misconceptions, there's things that people assume are true about conformal coatings that actually don't hold up when we think about it. And the first one I wanna point out is that no, these are not waterproof. These coatings are designed to come into contact with moisture. They can withstand intermittent splashing, high humidity, things like that. But it is not meant to be fully submerged over the long term for moisture protection. They, they simply do not hold up. The other misconception is that they protect against electrostatic discharge. So if you were to build up a charge and then try and discharge it over the circuit board, what would happen is Coated components would in fact be insulated, but if you had any kind of exposed connectors, then that they may potentially short out and damage the circuit. Okay, so next we're gonna look at some of the industry standards that are used as a way of defining a conformal coating's fitness for use. And I wanna start with this one. This is the IPC CC830 standard. Now this was introduced back in 1998 and what it does is it replaces an old mill standard, the mill I46058C. So that standard was retired and it was replaced by this new standard, the IPC CC830, which was instituted by the IPC committee, the Institute for Printed Circuit Boards. So here are the different criteria involved in the IPC CC830 test. Now, what I've done is highlighted some of the more rigorous testing standards. Some of these are actually not so much tests, but just they record certain characteristics of the coding, and it's not necessarily measured on a pass-fail scale. But the ones I've highlighted are some of the checks they employ to determine a coding's fitness for use. So we'll look at the first one, for example, fungus. That is where they incubate the coating versus a control to look for any signs of bacterial growth. And that test typically runs about seven days. Flexibility, they test the coating flexibility because these are inherently flexible top coats. So one of the more important features when you're looking at conformal coatings. Flammability, they run this in as a horizontal surface. And we're gonna look at the flammability test in the next slide. This is not a particularly difficult test to pass, but it basically tests the coating's ability to self-extinguish when placed on a horizontal plane. Moisture insulated and resistance is simply the coating's ability to maintain a certain dielectric performance when immersed under high humidity for several days. Thermal shock is simply its ability to maintain onto the coated substrate when it's being shocked between two extreme temperatures, minus 65 to 125 Celsius. And the hydrolytic stability is sort of a long-term aging test. And how they used to run it is they used to submit it to a high temperature 
over the course of about four and a half months and they look for discoloration. Now, since then in the latest revision, they've actually removed that test and they simply look for any coding defects like delamination, that sort of thing. So it's a very rigorous and thorough evaluation of these coatings under different circumstances to determine whether they're fit to be used as conformal coatings. Now, here is the test substrate or the test panel that they employ for a lot of the dielectric testing. And I bring this up because I want you to notice the arrows pointing here. Here on the bottom, we have traces that are very closely spaced together. And these were used in pass fail criteria in revision B. Now that has since been replaced with revision C. And you can see from the arrows on the top, Traces are a little further apart, so revision C by and large is not quite as difficult and rigorous to pass. Now with MG Chemicals, when we do certify a coating, we also include which revision it was certified to. Next, we're going to look at the UL746E standard. Now this standard is a bit more complex than the IPC standard. It actually comprises of three different coating designations. And we're going to start by looking at the conformal coating designation, which includes both dielectric testing and flammability testing. So let's start with the dielectric component of it. So we start with the substrate and we attach two electrical leads onto points A and B before conformally coating our board. Then what we do is place an electric foil over top of the coated portion of the board. We then attach leads onto points A and B and hook it up to a voltage source. And what they do for this test is they then blast it with about 6,000 volts of electricity. And what we're looking for is whether the insulation on the coating can hold up and withstand this voltage surge. So what we expect to see if it fails, if there's a pinhole at any point in the copper trace, and remember, current is going to follow the path of least resistance. So what would happen is it would puncture that weak point in the coating, make contact with the electrical foil, which is attached to point B, and essentially short out the circuit. So in that case, you would expect that the voltage would essentially short and drop to zero. If the insulation holds up, then you would expect the overall voltage to be the same as the initial pulse, around 6,000 volts. So that is the dielectric portion of the test, very difficult to pass. What they do is they put the boards and coating under various stresses, thermal stresses, environmental stress, humidity stress, and then they test to see whether the insulation of the coating is held up with this sort of voltage shock test. After that, the, what they then do is check the flammability of coated strips. So what you do is you coat these flammability strips which are inherently flame retardant themselves, and you coat each side with the conformal coating. Then what you do is you take a Bunsen burner and set the coating on fire. You place it under the flame for 10 seconds, in which case it has roughly 10 seconds then to self-extinguish. You reintroduce the flame for a second, 10 second interval, and then remove. So what it's doing is it's testing the coating's ability to self-extinguish under the presence of a flame. This is done vertically. There's different classes, V1, V0, V2, depending on the relative self-extinguishing time of the coating itself. So this all comprises the conformal coating portion of the test. If you're just designated as a permanent or a resist coating, then it's just the flammability of the conformal coating that's checked. So MG Chemicals actually has products that meet both the permanent resist as well as the conformal coating standard. Now we're going to look at the different solutions MG Chemicals has within its conformal coating portfolio. First, we're going to look at acrylic conformal coatings. Now, these are great coatings when the circuit is exposed to more mild contaminants, things like, you know, moisture, dust, fungus, these sorts of things. They hold up very well, very easy to use, and they can be easily reworked if needed, meaning you can simply remove coating, touch up areas, very easy to do. The one drawback for this coating family type is that it really doesn't hold up to solvent exposure. So something to think about when choosing this coating. 
Now, MG Chemicals has two acrylic conformal coating types, the 419D, which is a UL94V0 certified coating. As well, it is certified to the IPC CC830 Revision B standard and 419E. 419E is a full UL746E conformal coating. As well, it is certified to the IPC CC830C standard. Next, we're going to look at our polyurethane conformal coating, the 4223F. Now, by comparison, this coating offers enhanced ruggedization when you compare it to an acrylic conformal coating, namely in things like scratch, abrasion resistance, as well as some resistance to chemical exposures, mild chemicals such as alcohols or aromatics. Now, if you'll notice the picture at the top of the slide, the 4223F was tested against salt spray oxidation. Now, this was done for seven days and as you can see the coated sample held up very well against the control. Also we had this tested for sulfur gas resistance. Now this is a byproduct you might see in a gas field so important if you're working in that kind of environment and again when you compare it to the control the uncoated sample you'll see significantly less tarnish accumulated on the coated sample. So the 4223F is certified as a conformal coating under the UL746E standard and was certified under the IPC CC830B standard. Now the one drawback you need to consider though is that it has a long cure time. So it does require heat in order to fully cure and that's just one thing to take into consideration. Next, one of our more popular acrylic conformal coating types, the silicone acrylic hybrid conformal coating. So what we've done here is we've actually blended two different resin types, acrylic with silicone. And you sort of get the best of both worlds. You get the high temperature resistance afforded by silicone and the ease of rework that you get from acrylics. Now I've included a picture of a drone and that's because based on a lot of internet reviews, a lot of people are using this for circuit board protection within things like RC cars, drones, that sort of thing. And that's again because it can withstand these intermittent splashing and temperature swings that devices like RC cars, drones would experience. So MG Chemicals has two such conformal coatings, the 422B as well as the newly developed 422C. Now with these coatings, they are both UL94V0 certified and known for their high temperature resistance. The one consideration, however, is that it does not hold up to solvent or high humidity as well. That's the interesting thing about silicones. They actually have very good moisture protection, but are more or less prone to spoiling when under high humidity. Next, we're gonna look at silicone conformal coatings. Now, this class of coatings are 100% solids, fast cure coatings and they're more soft spongy consistency when cured so they're very good for delicate type of parts now these coatings were also subjected to additional testing we see that again it was tested against the salt spray five days immersion and held up particularly well preventing the copper traces from any types of visible corrosion when you compare it to a different competitor or a different chemistry in a polyurethane the other test that was run was noxious gases. So these are things like sulfides, sulfates, nitrates, that sort of thing. And then again, you can see that the copper trace was no worse for wear after 21 days immersion. So we have two coatings, the ECC 3011 and the ECC 3051S. Both coatings are UL94V0 certified as well as meeting the IPC CC830 standard. Now the thing you want to consider with these are they cure via a moisture mechanism. It reacts with atmospheric moisture so these are very sensitive and you just have to tailor your processing accordingly. And typically to do that that requires advanced coating equipment so just something to consider. Next let's look at epoxy conformal coatings. Now when we think about epoxies they are special materials in that they provide superior types of protection in harsh environments. So in this example we can see with the animation 
they're using it for protection in a circuit that's under a car hood. And that would be very appropriate. We've actually qualified this certain customers for that kind of use, just because they can hold up especially well to that kind of exposure to fuel vapors, solvents, that sort of thing. So that's the primary application for an epoxy type material is when you need that enhanced ruggedization, that superior protection against harsh chemicals. So MG Chemicals has the 4225 epoxy conformal coating. This is a two part coating. So it's a bit more difficult to use in that you have to measure out the two different components, mix it, and then you have to consider the shelf life. The curing is a bit longer than, than normal. But again, when you do need that sort of premium solvent protection, consider an epoxy material. Lastly, you want to look at UV curable conformal coatings. Now, unlike every other coating that we've looked at so far, these coatings cure only when exposed to certain wavelengths of UV light. So they find a lot of application when you have a demand for a high throughput. So whereas other coatings may take either minutes or potentially hours to cure, these types of coatings can be cured in seconds. Okay. And they offer a lot of benefits over other chemistries. They have superior solvent resistance, pretty good temperature resistance. The one drawback, of course, is the cost. And that's not only the material cost, but there is considerable capital expenditure when doing this. You need things like UV lamps, conveyor systems, radiometers. Now, of course, you could always outsource the work if needed. So that's not necessarily something that can't be overcome. It's just something to consider. MG Chemicals has the 4200 UV conformal coating. This is certified as a conformal coating under the UL746E standard and is also qualified under the IPC CC830C revision. Now we've gone over all the different solutions presented by MG Chemicals. Now we're going to go and look at the different criteria, the different questions, different requirements needed to ascertain which coating is right for you. So to do that, we sort of break it down into three main components. Certification and external environment, I consider more primary considerations, whereas processing capability more of a secondary. I mean, there's easier workarounds with respect to processing, but with certifications, external environment, these things tend to be more black and white, and, and we should place a lot more emphasis on these sorts of things. Okay, so with certifications, again, we've already talked about this. We start with the IPC CC830 standard. And again, that replaces the MIL I46058C standard. And that standard was retired in 1998. So if you've commercialized a conformal coating after 1998, it cannot be qualified to the MIL standard. Now, I have not come across anyone who refused to look at any of our conformal coatings because it did not meet the mill standard. Once I explain to them how the IPC standard has come in to replace it, they usually mull that over and that is sufficient for them to consider our conformal coatings. And then the other one is the UL746E conformal coating standard, which we've already talked about. And with that, we need to know whether it needs to be qualified as conformal coating or if they're okay with just the UL94 testing requirements. So with respect to certifications, this tends to be very black and white. Either you have it or you don't. And customers typically will only consider coatings if they meet certain certifications. Look at the external environment. Things to consider as to whether this coating is going to hold up over the long run when exposed to these different conditions. So the first thing we want to look at is UV light, sunlight, that sort of thing. And with that, certain chemistries are or can be excluded. So I would recommend something like an acrylic or a silicone. There's nothing inherent in their polymer backbone that would make them prone to photo oxidation. Whereas other chemistries like epoxies, polyurethanes, UV curables are more prone to photo oxidation. They could darken in yellow over time, which may not be desired. Next, solvent vapors. 
So in particular, we talked about epoxy and UV, how they hold up very well when exposed to these types of materials. Polyurethane, yes and no. It sort of depends on the degree of exposure and the particular solvent type. Sometimes it will hold up, sometimes not so well. Not recommended, however, are the thermal plastic materials, the silicones, acrylics. Really, short term, these things aren't going to last, so we, we shouldn't consider them. And then lastly, let's think about humidity levels. And really, all that does is exclude silicones. And again, they're, they're kind of odd materials. They've got very good moisture protection, but not particularly good in human environments. And then more of a secondary consideration are the processing capabilities of the customer. And I say it's secondary because you could employ workarounds like you could outsource it to a spray house if needed. So maybe they don't have the direct capability, but they could simply outsource it, have somebody else do the work for them. So one of the things to consider is, you know, their relative volume. What kind of application do they want to use? Do they want to spray coat it? they want to spray, they're going to need access to a fume hood, uh, an airline, air compressor, guns, that sort of thing. Whereas if you just want to dip or brush, that's fairly easy to do. If they still want to spray, we have certain coatings that are available in aerosol. So that does rule out other coating products if they want to do that. Next, we look at equipment. And that's just the equipment needed to you know, fully process and cure the different coating types. So we talk about things like acrylics or silicones. These things can air dry. So you really don't require any specialized equipment for applying these. Polyurethanes and epoxies really require an oven to reach full cure, whereas UV requires more advanced equipments like lamps, conveyors, radiometers, that sort of thing. So just something to think, think about when recommending different products. But again, we could work around that by introducing them to a spray house or subcontracting it. Now let's look at the different market segments that conformal coatings are typically used within. Now, one of the primary ones is in consumer electronics. They're just everywhere and all these circuit boards, again, need protection from the everyday elements. So we look at things like television sets, laptops, tablets, watches, smartphones, things like that. Very popular in using conformal coating. Automotive, these have become very much moving computers within the last 30 years. But again, we need to consider the different portions of the vehicle. So you might employ a much different conformal coating type for something under the hood of a car versus something that's in the dashboard in a more controlled environment. The other thing I wanna point out is that with automotive, you might have a coating or circuit board in a place that's vulnerable to shocks, bumps, and, and things like that. And certain conformal coating types can actually help improve the strength of solder joints. Lastly, in medical, and again, this is largely for medical instrumentation. When it comes to implanted materials, that would need more advanced testing. And MG Chemicals is not really taken on that kind of testing yet simply because we haven't had the demand. That can be very costly and time consuming. So should the opportunity present itself, we would consider that. But currently, in terms of medical implants, we, we really have to stay neutral on that. In terms of the different resources that we have available for our conformal coatings, we start with the category data sheet. Now, this is a package which contains information about all of our different conformal coatings, just generalities, the different products that we have. It's, it's a good summary of what I've talked about today. And then for more specific information pertaining to the individual products, we have the technical data sheet. And this will include things like viscosity, density, coverage, electrical, as well as some mechanical data. And then we also have an application guide, and this is a general how-to guide, whether you want to dip, spray, 
or use an automatic dispense type, we give different starting points and different suggestions and notes on how to go about applying the different coatings, cure settings, that sort of thing. So it's a very useful guide with respect to applying these coatings. So let's wrap things up. What are conformal coatings? Conformal coatings are these flexible top coats and they're used mainly to protect PCBs from everyday exposure to things like moisture, dust, fungus, electrical shorts, as well as any other thing that it may be exposed to within its vicinity. In terms of testing standards, the IPC CC830 and the UL746E standard are industry-wide standards to certify conformal coatings as being fit for use. MG Chemicals contains several coatings compliant with both these standards. MG Chemicals has a full line of conformal coatings spread over six principal chemistry types, acrylic, polyurethane, silicone acrylic hybrid, silicone, epoxy, and UV curable. Now when considering which coating to use, each chemistry has unique properties, making it suitable for certain application. And again, you can refer back to the radar diagrams that I've included in those slides to see where the advantage disadvantage lies with each chemistry type. When choosing the right product, consider three main things. What certifications are required, if any? What environmental considerations do I need to accommodate? Where will the circuit board be exposed to? And what should we consider? And then finally, as a secondary thing, what are the processing capabilities of the customer? But again, we can work around that by subcontracting the work out to somebody else. And then to wrap it all up, these products are used across many common market segments, things like consumer electronics, transportation, medical industry. That's just to name a few. Really, all electronics need conformal coatings and choosing the right one is just matching the requirements of that particular product to what your coating is able to do. That concludes today's webinar. Now we open the floor to any questions. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to get a hold of me. My principal email address is michael.strong at mgchemicals.com or you can also reach me at the support email that I've listed there. And below that is my direct extension. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. So uh, it's time to go to questions. Okay, first question is, what's the difference between IPC CC830 and IPC CC830B and IPC CC830C? Yes, yeah, so they've changed up a few things and I can comment on the B and C revision. We, we hadn't qualified anything to the earlier revisions and I never really looked at those standards all that closely, but especially important with B and C, you have the test coupon, which has copper tracing and what they do to verify pass fail on many tests is to verify what's called the dielectric withstand voltage. And that's to say you can hit the circuit with 1500 volts, leave it for a minute before ramping down and you're looking for any kind of flashover or arcing to see that the insulation is holed up. So what's happened between the B and C revision is that within the B revision, you had the traces placed much closer together than they are for the C revision. So in a lot of ways, the C revision has diluted, we'll say, the intensity of that test to make it a little easier to pass. There's other sort of subtle differences. The one thing too is that they typically add more conformal coding types with the new revision. So with the latest revision, they included two new types and that was ultra thin and that's not specified to a chemistry. That is actually specified to a coating thickness. So anything under 12 and a half microns or half a mil is considered an ultra thin coating. And they've included something called synthetic rubber or styrenated block copolymer. So those, those were kind of the major revisions done between B and C. But again, the earlier ones, I, I never really looked at because they weren't necessarily applicable and we don't have anything qualified for that standard. But I, I really don't find anyone ever asks about the typical or the current revision 
that the coding is qualified to. Okay, uh, next question. Are there added properties with the UV curable material that would open them to use on flexible printed circuitry? Uh, again, I, I don't know about added. The, the main benefits are it actually has very good solvent resistance because of the high degree of cross-linking. But the key advantage to those coatings is processability. So I, I don't know about circuit type per se. You know, it, it has those as the main advantages, whereas the disadvantages tends to be things like the cost or just the amount of capital equipment you need to apply them. But my answer would be, you know, in terms of a substrate type, no. Okay, next question. I think that's the question. Are there silicon coding that is UV curable? Customer asked me two days ago. Yeah, so we actually sell a, it kind of borders on a blowable paste coating. I mean, you're not going to get a typical coating thickness out of this, but it's something that our supplier Momentum, Momentum has developed that they're really trying to garner some attention for. So there are UV curable silicones. And the one I'm thinking of is especially soft and it sort of has a translucent amber haze to it. Not your typical coating though. It's it's not as liquidous as you'd expect a coating. It sort of borders that gray area where you got a paste adhesive and a flowable liquid coating. Okay, Mike, I think we have a follow-up comment from John on the UV material and printed circuit uh, board. So the comment is traditionally these would require 1500 volts of breakdown protection with excellent flexibility and ability to withstand 1000 hours of 80-80 environmental exposure. Yeah, and we've we've looked at 808585 with some of the conductive coatings. Now they run kind of proxy tests in the different qualifications, especially for UL, they run the thermal aging for about six and a half weeks, and they do it substantially at a temperature substantially higher than what you qualify it to. Now we have the capability to do 85-85 testing if needed. And honestly, 1500 volt breakdown is, is nothing, even if they want to use a standard IPC board. So that's something we can do internally. We haven't looked at that per se, just because we haven't had the request. But if you were to ask my opinion, yeah, we'd easily pass that. Kind of test because again it's it's got such a high cross link density that it's it's got very good you know moisture humidity protection that sort of thing so something we could look at if needed okay mike can you just give some information about the recommended dry film thickness for most of these formulations yeah it's going to be a okay so if we look at solvent borne coatings and this is specified with an IPC. So with the solvent borns and you think they're about the acrylics, the polyurethane, the epoxy and the silicone acrylic hybrid, you're going to be between about one and three mils. And that's, you know, pretty standard. Usually in practice, you're more like one to two mils dry film thickness. For silicones, they've also considered the 100% solids as well as they considered materials that aren't traditional coatings, but maybe they're flowable self-leveling adhesives and they've expanded that to two to eight mils dry film thickness. Now with the UV curable, the designation is either that it's a urethane, an epoxy or an acrylic based on what the, the main percentage by weight is of this sort of polymer blend. And I know that kind of sounds confusing, but I'm saying it could be either or. In practice with the UV curable, because there's such high solids, you're gonna get about two to three mils dry film thickness. Okay, next question. Why do I experience the bedding on some areas of the boards? Now that could, I mean, the, the easiest explanation is cleanliness. And you could have materials, residual oils, cutting fluids, things like that. But the other thing you have to think about that's a little more difficult to investigate is they put this solder mask 
over the circuit board and then they cure it. And sometimes there's been investigations where they found that the surface energy is inconsistent along the different parts of a circuit board. And that could be either a change of the coating itself. And I'm not talking about the conformal coating, I'm talking about the, the solder resist coating, or it's just a method of how they cured it. And sometimes they found that there's just inconsistencies in the surface energy of that. So the lower the surface energy of the substrate, the harder it is to wet out for a liquid, because that wetting out is the difference between the surface energy, which ideally is high, and the surface tension of the liquid. So assuming the surface tension of the liquid is the same as it was and always has been, then you may need to investigate the surface energy of that localized region in the circuit board. And that's that's sort of the explanation behind why oils and other things like that can affect wetting and, and coating adhesion. Because again, localized, you'd have low surface energy, very difficult parts to wet out. Okay, next question. Tip of dip component is hard to get full cover of, conform of coating material. Any processes suggested? Well, yeah, so dipping is tricky because the thing is liquids behave like liquids. So it's going to flow and sag under the pressure force of gravity as you remove it. And yeah, you will get, and that's, that's sort of the same with every technique, except with spray and you put a, a thinner coat, it tends to dry quicker and you don't get that effect. But unfortunately that is one of the things is that you get some sort of sagging around the, the dip method. And, and really you can try to, you know, you might do a little bit better if you try and laminate coating. So what I mean by that is dilute the coating down so that you deposit not just one thicker layer, but multiple thin layers to try and get tip coverage. But yeah, again, when you're going over the edge of a resistor or a capacitor or something like that, those areas are, are just notoriously hard to get good coverage over. Uh, next question. Success is stories from automotive industry. Do we have one? There was one that we worked on when we first came out with the epoxy conformal coating, and that was for a powertrain for the, it was a type of Formula One car, but I remember it was for the, the powertrain. So we were able to qualify that. I can't remember where that sort of project ended up. But we did have, and we were sort of going between the contract manufacturer and the manufacturer of the, the part itself, but we did get approval on that. So that, that would sort of be one example. We never ended up running any of the typical automotive tests you'd see, like the 8585, it's pretty common in automotive. And I don't think they ever asked for something like that. They, they may have ended up qualifying it internally themselves, but that's one that I can remember distinctly. Mike, I remember 422B and uh, Volkswagen Golf. I don't really know the exact application, but that was one of the conformal coding that was actually was like uh, running for two years. Okay, so that, that must have been in, internally though, I'm thinking like that, that, that would have limited applicability in terms of where you could put it, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not fully aware of that particular one. Okay, uh, moving on to next question. Do we have a UV curable and RTV curing silicone? So again, yes, the our RTV supplier, Momentum, does have a product that's UV curable. Now, I... <laughs> I'd have to check and go back to see if it has a secondary RTV cure mechanism. It must. And that's just because, again, you're going to have shadowed areas wherever you have topography. So UV is line of sight. And any kind of shadowed areas, you won't necessarily get curing. So there must be a secondary cure. But yes, there are those materials available. Can we find gravity info of both liquid and dry film? Yeah, so what do we mean by gravity? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to understand too. Okay. Will, if you can clarify that, that would be great. Uh, what do you mean by gravity info? 
So moving to next one, can I switch from using the aerosol version of an acrylic coating to the liquid version? Would I yeah, see any going... change? Would I see any changes in the performance of the coating? You won't see any changes. The changes you're going to have to make internally are in processing. So the aerosol, there's really not much to it. You can use it anywhere you want. The product as sold can just be applied. You press the button, you're good to go. Whereas the liquid depends on what kind of application process you want to employ, whether it's dipping, whether it's brush. In terms of spray, and that tends to be the most popular one because it has so many advantages, there is the element now where there's added equipment needed. So typically we use say like a medium pressure or high, high volume, low pressure type of spray gun. You also need obviously the airlines to connect. So you'd need a compressor as well as a fume booth, because again, you're generating a lot of aerosols, a lot of fumes. So you want to be able to do that without, <clears throat> you know, overwhelming your lab space with these fumes. So there is considerations in, in getting that up and going. And then there's the dilution factor because uh, again, as sold, we sell them in, in pretty high solids as sold and you need to dilute them down so they're they're sprayable. But in terms of the cured coating, no. So we'll uh, give a clarification, a specific gravity proportion. So I think the gravity between liquid and, and solid. Yeah, so that's, there is, Subtle differences, but you know, if you look at a solvent-borne coating, a lot of solvents have, say, a specific gravity of 0 0.8, 0 0.85, that sort of thing. Whereas the resins themselves can ha be a little over one, so there is that discrepancy. Whereas something like a UV conformal coating, which is almost 100% solids, no, they're sort of all in the same. They're they're a little more dense. And in its cured state, obviously, because it's it's now been cross-linked and it's it's sort of shrunk a tiny bit, so it's a bit more dense, but not not noticeably. Whereas if you contain if you compare the dry film of a solvent borne versus you know the liquid version, yeah, there is some difference because the resins tend to be a bit more dense than a lot of the solvents that they're dissolved in. If that answers your question. Okay, so do you have any flyers regarding our codings which we can show to our customers? So, do we have any? Mm, actually, so, so we, we what we what we trying to do is uh, to gather all the uh, kind of summarize all the information about each product line in our category data sheet, which Michael mentioned uh, towards the end of the presentation. So, if you go to our website. Uh, if you go to our con conformal coding page, is a main page or index page. So there is a drop down that you can download the conformal coding flyer. It will uh, summarize all our product offering with all the features and benefits. And if you need more information, you have to go to product uh, page and then download the technical data sheet. Okay, uh, product roadmap. Any new product being qualified? No, no, no. We we've pumped out a lot of these coatings in the last few years, and I think right now we just need to get more momentum behind our conformal coatings. So, fortunately, we're in a position now where we can kind of evaluate the market and see where we might have opportunities, and also we sort of have the expertise to sort of, you know, design these things the way they needed to be designed. But currently, no, there's there's really no <clears throat> short-term plans to develop new products for conformal coatings. And I think the question is more about anything being qualified. I think most of our conformal coating either has IPC qualification or U, uh, UL qualification. So uh, unless we come up with a new product, so pretty much most of our product are qualified. Okay, so when is it possible to get ECC, sorry, ECC 3051S coding to Europe? So I'm not the right guy to be asking. That's a difficult proposition because of how we're kind of restricted in selling Momentum products. So send me an email and, and we can evaluate that, but it's it's got its limitations. 
Okay, so I have one more question in the list. Does orange peel affects the performance of the coating or it is mostly affecting the cosmetic of it? Mostly cosmetic. If you've covered your surface sufficiently, which you can check with black lamp, you know, orange peel doesn't look great and it's sort of a product of how you've prepped the surface and how you've applied it, but no, it, it, long term, no, it, it really doesn't affect the performance. Okay, so I have one more question. How long have you guys been making conformal coatings and have you partnered with any coating houses? Do you coat at all in-house on a production scale? Okay, so let's take apart that question. Yep. Let's see here. So conformal coatings date, but in terms of what I presented today, I'd say the oldest one we have is the 422B which I think has been around for about 10 or 11 years. And we, we had a few conformal coatings that predated that. So we certainly have a history of that. I, I mean, I would say we're established something like 15 years overall in conformal coatings. Partnered, uh, sort of, I guess you could say we, we partner with some people. We, we're in contact with spray houses. And I, I think the main mechanism is that they contact us if a customer has called out one of our coatings. But we are trying to talk to them more just to let these guys know the coatings that we have available. But in terms of internal capability, I mean, we have a spray booth. But no, we we don't do anything at production scale. We might do something if we're trying to work alongside a customer for proof of concept. But that's really it. Now, we do have a new coating machine that we're trying to get up and running qualified. But again, that would be proof of concept. We're, we're really not looking to sell a service. Okay, I think that's a question that probably would be answered by one of our sales team, but uh, I'll just read it. Do you have any success stories for converting large volume users of conformal coatings like human cell users in, just, in a contract manufacturing environment? Yeah, I think that's the right call, more of a salesperson type of question. I think I got received one new question here. Who is your competition and how do you differentiate yourself from them? So a lot of our competitors are places like Dow Corning actually has quite an extensive line of conformal coatings. Huma Seal kind of rules the roost. If you look around, they, they kind of have every base touched, but we also see other places like Electrolube has a pretty, pretty expansive conformal coating portfolio. Tech Spray Chemtronics have sort of covered the basics. And in terms of how we compare, I think we have advantages. A lot of our feedback is we provide better customer service and can be more responsive to customers' needs. But if you look at our line versus some of the other lines, they, they kind of all look the same. We've covered a lot of the same bases and you can't really say that our coatings are better than others. Like, no, it, it's that's just not the case. It, it matters again, and that's what's good about these standards is it shows sort of a, it's an equalizer. It sort of says, well, every these coatings have met a specific threshold for fitness of use, and that's sort of what they're put in place for. So, I, I would say you get to decide if we're differentiated. You know, get a hold of us, see what kind of support we can offer, see what kind of portfolio we have to offer and whether we can, you know, work within the customer's requirements. We understand conformal coatings very well and, and our portfolio is quite expansive. I, I think we have something to cover just about any application that's out there. But, and, and, and that's a tough question for me to answer because I don't know what our competitors are doing in terms of internally. Like that's, that's just something that is up to them and, yeah. I think just to add what Michael said, uh, if you look at different chemistry, we, we've got products that are qualified to IPC, IPC and UL for most of the chemistries that are out there. So that covers the basis for any, any specific needs. And so, for example, for epoxy, our epoxy conformal coding is uh, a really high quality. Most of epoxy conformal coding, they could not really get rid of air bubble in the in formula. Our conformal coding doesn't have that issue. 
And so in terms of quality, we, I think, um, rub shoulders to some of the big competitors. And also, as Michael mentioned, in terms of our, uh, our customer service. And so that has been MG's biggest uh, and competitive advantage. Okay, so I don't have any new question. So, oh, hold on. I think we have one question. We have time for it. Oh, no, I just, yeah, no, sorry. There's no new question. I think that's it. Uh, so again, so we will do our best to uh, send you a link, download link for this uh, session. So it will be available also on our website and we will put it on YouTube channel. And also we will put the link on to our LinkedIn page as well. We probably will have another one either on adhesive line or potting uh, compounds soon. So we'll announce that uh, hopefully in next week. Uh, so when we can firm up a date. Thank you so much for your attention and also taking the time to be with us today. Thank you.